Dooley, another semi-final for New Zealand. This is the 11th now that they've been involved in in World Cups, T20s and 50 over World Cups, which I think is a record matched by Pakistan and only beaten by Australia. Mm. How do you do it? Um, I don't, some say we overachieve. I just think we're sort of we're just a good team. Um, we're a very good tournament team, and I think that's that's one of the reasons that they seem to find a way to gel together. I've said in the past, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we only have a six franchise first-class sides, and at times when you get a dominant side, like Northern Districts are at the moment, there's seven guys, mm. you know, six, seven guys in any one team from that same team. It was Canterbury back in the 90s or the two, early 2000s when you had the, the Astles, the Flemings, the Cairns, the Harris, you know, all those sorts of guys. So because they predominantly come from one team, they seem to gel quite well together and they know each other's game. Um, I think that's part of the reason and just the fact that we're generally pretty well led We've had some great captains in McCullum and Williamson now and Fleming in the, in the past. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to put your finger on one thing, but they may be a couple of contributing factors. You're implying there that the resource disadvantage is actually an advantage for yeah, you. Possibly, yeah. That, that, that's, you know, that, that may be the, the case. Six teams, not much to choose from, but the, the, sort of the way they get together and gel is, is a good thing. I was thinking about the potential for England's team to create a golden legacy, given that they've won the 2019 World Cup. They have a chance to hold this one here now in two games of time potentially and also with two World Cups to come in the next two years but that stands for New Zealand as well because you were finalists in 2019 you are the winners of the inaugural World Test yeah. Championship semi-final here now with those two World Cups to come is that something that this group of players will be thinking about? Yeah I, I'm sure they will um, they'll be able to sort of look back in, in time and see how successful it was they're very successful winning that that test championship I know that and you know if they manage to get through and win this tournament they're the width of Ben Stokes bat away from holding all three trophies <laughs> which is, is quite phenomenal from a New Zealand point of view um, look it, it's a side that is very uh, they're driven by success but they're also driven by the history and trying to create history and that started a lot with Brendan McCullum how do you want to leave the team when you leave what do you want your legacy to be and that was the big turnaround in New Zealand cricket as far as an attitude thing is concerned and to also play New Zealand style not try and play an Australian style of cricket not be aggressive not in your face uh, I mean I know they're, they're probably seen as the nice guys of world cricket but they play the game pretty tough as well there's not they're not all nice yeah. um, everybody is obviously reflecting and referring back to that remarkable game from two years ago Will the players have just shut the door on that? Will that have any impact uh, upon this semi-final to come? I don't think so. Um, you, you know yourself, Beth. There's, there's a huge respect between Owen Morgan and Kane Williamson, and I think that was shown straight after the game. That that respect for the, the, the you know the captains, the respect for the teams in general. There's a few players who were involved in that game, but the, a lot of those guys from that 50 over World Cup are not here. Um, so this is a, a quite a different looking. New Zealand team. There's no talk of revenge. New Zealanders are just not that, not that nasty. Are they? Just, we're too nice to talk about revenge. Um, you mentioned Kane Williamson there, who has been suffering with an elbow injury actually throughout this tournament. I was listening to him today, and he said he's had to really. Ba he's somebody who likes to hit a lot of balls, but he's had to balance trying to stay fresh and fit for the matches uh, against that practice requirement. A, um, how much of an impact has that had on his batting? And B, just give us an indication of, of how important his leadership skills are to New Zealand, because obviously he's a very different style of person and captain to McCollum who came before him. Yeah, look, it's usually the guy that's throwing the balls to him that's got the elbow issues, because <laughs> he's the one that has to do it for hour upon hour upon hour. Kane just loves to hit, hit cricket balls, and it's a... Uh, you know, I mean, it's no surprise that he's as good as he is because of that very reason. He, he's a, such a great thinker of the game, uh, a very calm, measured captain. He learned a lot from Brendan and has taken a lot of what Brendan sort of introduced into the New Zealand camp on board. But he's just a different type of captain. The, the Kane Williamson we see and, and you see at a press conference is vastly different from the Williamson behind closed doors. He's cheeky. He's, um, he's quite funny. At, at times, and he's um, you know he's one of the sort of not it's a practical joker, but he's um, yeah he's he's pretty crafty behind closed doors and, and and amongst that team he's known as you know as a very funny sort of a guy. But his captaincy and his batting for this New Zealand side is, is so vital and so crucial. He's got great resources with the ball, but on the batting front I think that's probably where England have the advantage. So him 
you know, just anchoring in, in innings. I, I don't know that New Zealand have got the power to get a 180, 190, but if they chase the 150, 160, that's his wheelhouse, you know, that's yeah. his game. Well, maybe come on to some of the specifics of the, of the game, but just ahead of the tournament, this, this World T20 here in UAE, what were your expectations for New Zealand? Because many people felt that the conditions here might not necessarily play to New Zealand's strengths. Obviously, those some of those grounds in New Zealand, good pitches, very small boundaries. That's quite different to here. Yeah, I I was hopeful of, of a semi final. I, I wasn't um, overly confident. My issue was always around the big boy power, and, and I think it's something that that Australia and England have in spades. Pakistan have got bits and pieces of, and I just wasn't sure around the Phillips Nisham power in that middle, and and that was my big worry. Could we turn a 150 into a 180 in the last two and a half to three overs? Could we hunt down a score when we needed 12, 14, 15 and over in the last two or three overs? So that was the, the issue for me around this New Zealand side. Um, I, I, you know, the condition thing, I said for a long time New Zealand got their selection policy wrong by picking an extra spinner or two. Milne should have been in the side right from the get-go. Astle shouldn't have been in the side. And I think the sides that have gone really spin-heavy have got it wrong. We've seen the, the surfaces. They're not turning pitches. They are pitches that if you bowl well as a quick bowler, or even a medium pace, you'll have success. So I think those sides that went overly spin dependent kind of got it wrong. Um, New Zealand have been experimenting as well. You expect to come into a, a tournament like this with a, a settled plan and a set 11. Actually, at the last minute, you've changed a couple of key positions, haven't you? Mitchell to the top of the order, not done it before, and Devon Conway, who is with the best will in the world, a part-time yeah. wicketkeeper, suddenly given the gloves. Yeah, crazy. I mean, I didn't see that coming at all. I, I know New Zealand were keen to get the two all-rounders in, in Mitchell and Nisham. They both can offer plenty with the ball if required. Daryl Mitchell's bowled a lot of overs in the death for his franchise side at home uh, and is a very powerful striker. But maybe they looked at that early in the tournament and thought, OK, there might be a bit of spin up front. And the quick bowlers is something he relishes as well. Having grown up and played a lot of his cricket in Perth, he, he loves the quick bowling, he plays the short ball well, and he doesn't mind running at spinners. And Martin Guptill, modern Martin Guptill, is just slightly less um, adventurous, maybe at the start. He's not quite as quick as he was two or three years ago off the markers uh, with the bat. So maybe they wanted a little bit of power. They didn't think Conway Guptill combination was going to be the right way to go so I applaud it, it it's very un-New Zealand like not mm. to come in with a plan and then the, the um, Conway keeping situation again I think they just they were just trying to find a way to get that extra bowling option into the mix get Adam Milne into the side play the three genuine quicks or the three genuine seam bowlers two spinners and then the all-rounders as well so it's worked out um, Conway is a, a part-time keeper but I mean I was, I've been impressed with the, the work ethic um, he's put in that, that catch the other night off the of East yeah. Zodi. Uh, you know, he's done a good job. I can't work out whether this game being played at Abu Dhabi is to New Zealand's advantage or not, in the sense that Abu Dhabi actually has seen some of the higher scoring games. India made the highest score in the competition yeah. here. Pakistan have made 189. There's another score of 189. So you think a high potential for a high scoring game is to England's advantage. However, Abu Dhabi also has the biggest boundaries, and that may be some protection against England's power-packed batting lineup. I, I, I agree with you totally. I, I think it, it becomes a more even contest at Abu Dhabi because of the size of the boundaries. New Zealand spinners certainly come into play. The power of England's batting at, at a place like Sharjah, it, it, it'll sail over the boundary quite comfortably, whereas Abu Dhabi, you have to get it well. You still have to hit the ball well to get it over the boundary. So that brings New Zealand into play. New Zealand's um, top three bowlers in the tournament, Bolt, Southey, Santner, have all gone it well and truly under six and over throughout the tournament. So you've kind of got New Z the best or the most economical bowling attack in the tournament up against the most power-packed batting side in the tournament, which, which bodes well for, you know, for both sides if one of them gets on top. But uh, yeah, I, I think Abu Dhabi evens it up a touch. And the size of the ground, does that also bring a, a spotlight on New Zealand's fielding, which has been outstanding so far? I'm thinking of the catch from Conway, both with the gloves and in the deep yeah. when he got rid of Mohamed Hafiz, mm. the brilliant save from Mitchell. Darryl Mitchell yeah. the other day against Afghanistan, um, Clem Phillips, who seems to yeah. be as quick as anybody prowling yeah. those boundary ropes. Yeah, there's, there's that side of it as well as the, the running between the wickets of Williamson, Conway, Guptill's incredibly quick. Um, so Phillips is ridiculously quick. So that might also play into New Zealand's hands a little bit through the middle stages, having to work the spinners around. I mean, the, the biggest danger, I think, obviously, you've, you've got to look after Chris Wokes up front. I think when he gets on top of 
a side or, or picks up a wicket or two early, England really get that. You know, they sort of they puff their chests out and they go, don't they? When Chris Wokes bowls a couple of really tidy overs up front and Adil Rashid, uh, the other keys to me. If Williamson is batting at the time Adil Rashid is, is introduced into the attack, then New Zealand are in a good position because he plays spin. We saw what happened the other night with Rashid. So the running between the wickets, the big boundaries, and maybe seeing off Wokes early on. And I think a key matchup. I don't know what you think is going to be. Butler and Bastow, assuming Bastow opens against Bolton Saudi. I mean, this part of the world, power plays often determine and dictate the course of a game. And if England are going to get a big score, it's usually through that kind of opening yeah. combination, which is ultra aggressive. Again, some very smart, experienced, and versatile opening bowlers. Yeah, the B's and the M's are the two matchup I'm looking forward to. The Bolt, Butler, Bairstow, and then Moen and Martin Guptill. As I think if England decide to go up front with an off-spinner, Martin Guptill's match-up with him and Daryl Mitchell's match-up with Moen. So all the M's and all, all the B's, I think, is going to be a, a really good, um, you know, it, it's going to set the tone for the game, isn't it? I think that's what you want. You want your new ball bowlers to set the tone or your opening batsmen to set the tone. One way or the other, that's going to happen. Come on then, prediction. England are, to me, probably 65-35 favourites. I, I, I do think that they are the better side and they're playing the better cricket at the moment, but you just can't count New Zealand out. So... Look, it's a, as I say, 65-35. I think England are probably the better side. They should should win the game, but not played on paper. And the other semi, Pakistan, Australia. Oh, just you just get the feeling Australia are going to do enough. I mean, <laughs> Pakistan have been Sent brilliant. through gritted teeth. I know, I do, I do. <laughs> but I mean, Pakistan have been brilliant throughout the tournament. They've been the best side along with England. You just get the feeling at some stage there's a slip up, and I hope it's not in the semi final for their case because they've played wonderful cricket. They've been good to watch. I get a feeling that Aussie might be able to do it, though. And I You've been on like the money because it. you predicted Pakistan, you predicted ba Babar Azam to be top scorer. Yeah, well, I, I, said, I, I thought an England-Pakistan final. Right at the start of the tournament, I said England-Pakistan. I'm not going to go away from that. It's just a horrible feeling down here from you know, the down under the Australian side. It's a horrible feeling. Should be good.